Hello and welcome to session 10 of the Instron Biomedical Testing Open House, Biomedical Fatigue Applications Using Electrodynamic Test Systems. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Harriet Barnes, your host for this session. For this discussion, Calvin Poon, one of our sales support engineers, Jonathan Phillips, senior applications engineer, along with support from Mark Shuri, applications engineer, will be taking us through some common biomedical fatigue test standards and applications covering dentistry, implants, and orthopedics, and to see how an all electric testing system can help overcome the traditional drawbacks of fatigue testing. For today's presentation, the team will use about 40 minutes for their discussion, and then we should have some time for some questions. So I encourage you to send in any relevant questions you might have as we go along. One last thing I did want to mention before we begin. For those of you that are interested in receiving the single use code for free access to the Essentials of Biomedical Testing e-learning course, this is just a quick reminder that you'll want to complete the post-event survey that will display immediately following this session, I'll be sure to remind you again at the end. So with that said, I'm going to hand you over to Calvin. Right, welcome everyone to Insurance Biomedical Open House, where we'll discuss a bit about dynamic testing of biomedical devices in the next hour. I'm Calvin Poon, Sales Support Engineer for Insurance Dynamic Systems. I'll first go through a bit about different uh, international test standards for the biomedical industry and challenges that come with it. Uh, we will also have Jonathan Phillips, our senior applications engineer, who will go over some real-life biomedical testing applications, and Mark Shorey, our applications engineer, that will discuss a bit about our product offerings. Feel free to submit any questions as we go along, and we will aim to answer them at the end of the presentation. Today, we'll go through um, some common testing standards on biomedical devices, including dental implants, spinal constructs, hip implants, and a few other orthopedic-related tests. So for, for dental implants, um, dental implant materials co are constantly evolving um, to meet market expectation in value, longevity, and their uh, aesthetics. With information spreading much easier this, in this generation, um, patients become more informed on different available options. And from that, biomedical companies need more efficient and reliable results to not only pass regulatory standards and requirements, but also to capture the audience. The challenge with testing dental implants stems from the fact that they can come with different sizes and shapes which means there needs to be a way to standardize the testing of these implants. ISO 14801 creates a benchmark for determining the fatigue life of such dental implants and offers a standardized comparison between dental implants of different designs. Furthermore, a reliable test instruments that can simulate a loading profile up to five minute cycles and a specialized dental fixture to secure, se securely hold the assessment is required to fully comply with the standard. Um, we've also opted to design a fixture specifically to meet the standard. Um, and the zero to 45 degree angle adjustments will allow testing of both straight and angled implants with the same fixture. It is made of high quality stainless steel and uh, it's highly corros corrosion resistant. So it's compatible for use with a saline bath, as you can see on the, on the slide, to better simulate the operating conditions. Um, the electric post here is um, the system of choice in terms of ISO 14801. Um, it has a suitable load capacity range that matches the load experience with the dental implants in working condition. It is also designed to, com to be compatible with um, fluid baths, having no electrical connections integrated into the system table. And last but not least, it provides an accuracy that is, that is 10 times more than the standard uh, requirements. Um, so you can guarantee the system can comply and test a lot more. Um, so now we'll move on to spinal contracts. Um, service life testing of um, these spinal implants are very essential, um, as even in 
um, under normal patient activity, the spinal constructs can be subjected to high cyclic loading in axial rotation, dislocation, and also the bending motion, which could all result in fatigue failure. ASTM F1717 outlines three separate static tests and one fatigue test to summarize the critical tests needed um, to evaluate spinal constructs of different designs. The static test includes compressed bending, tensile bending, and torsion, and the fatigue test will be conducted in compressive bending. Together, they become the basis for mechanical comparison between different spinal Im implant assemblies. The challenge here um, is that the spinal constructs can feature a lot of different designs with varying dimensions, so mounting of the specimen securely can be a challenge. Tuning also becomes an imp important aspect of this, as this needs um, uh, the waveform response is key to ensure a correct loading profile in the fatigue test. Um, uh, sorry about this. Um, so our solution to this is the patented surface based tuning where a single static ramp can automatically tune all control channels on a single axis and offers great performance even in nonlinear specimens. We've also opted to design a dedica uh, dedicated spinal fixture featuring easy mounting of the specimen and it is compatible with an optional fluid bath um, where uh, with use with a temperature receptor circulator. And when it is used, low cells can be uh, have to be mounted onto the actuator, which means that um, it can be subjected to um, motion that affects the load, uh, the load readings. Um, our dynamic load cell with inertial compensation activated can be uh, can provide a compensated load reading to remove any inertial effects. With the electrical linear torsion system, alongside Blue Hill Universal software for st static tests and Wave Matrix 2 software for dynamic tests, we can complete all four test methods as described in ASTM F1717 or on one system. Now we'll move along to hip implant. So fatigue testing of hip implant poses a challenge um, that stems from the specimen geometry, most importantly in how precise it needs to be embedded. The fixture would need to support compression, bending, torsion loading in order to meet ISO 7206 and simulate the fatigue loading of a hip stem under normal operating conditions. Due to the nature of materials, High frequency testing can also cause heat builds up in the specimen, changing the testing environment. Um, Instron offers a dedicated hip femoral fatigue system that meets the requirements of ISO 7206 4, comprising of two stem potting base fixtures, a perspex saline bath, and a 135 degree potting cup that achieve ISO 7206-6. They can accommodate a, a, a wide variety of hip geometries, offset angles, embedding materials, and embedding depths. The system also includes a temperature res recirculator to ensure target temperature is reached but not exceeded the acceptable limits with an automatic feedback to the system and reduce test frequency if necessary. All of which can be controlled within Wave Matrix 2, and you can also create multiple test end criteria that are tailored to your specimen and test to suit test end criteria outlined in the standard. Right. Um, there is also a lot of other biomedical tests that you can perform with a fatigue system, and we'll now go for a few others here. So bone cements are used to bridge the gap between the implant and the bone, so their long-term stability is essential. According to ISO 16402, you can establish their mechanical properties using a miniature four-point bend fixture with a combination of quasi-static bend tests and flexoral um, 
fatigue test. These tests are conducted in a fluid bath filled with ringous solution and maintained at 37 degrees. The resulting stress strain curve and SN curve will allow the specimen to be characterized. The fatigue test of fracture um, knee tibial trays has been one of the most commonly reported failure mechanisms of total knee replacements. It is caused by loss of underlying bone support resulting in um, biological reactions such as wear-induced osseolo osseo osseolysis. Under these conditions, the tibial tray becomes mechanically unstable and, and the psychic clothing imparted by normal walking can cause fatigue cracks and ultimately lead to catastrophic failure. ISO 14879-1 provides a set of test parameters that can be used to determine and validate fatigue properties of different tibial tray designs. With our tibial tray fixture, the test specimen can be gripped securely and subject to cyclic loading that simulates normal walking um, positions. As with our other fixtures, this is also manufactured with corrosion resistant materials and designed to be used in fruit baths to better simulate infill conditions. Um, so you, as you can uh, as you can imagine, you can also test any range of materials and components that aren't tied to any international standards. And now I will pass my mic to Jonathan that will go through some examples of these. Thanks very much, Kelvin. Um, yeah, so as Kelvin mentioned, um, obviously there's lots of testing you can do that follow standards, but uh, lots of people do sort of research that, that doesn't necessarily adhere to some of these. So I'm gonna now run through a few examples of testing that some of our customers are doing um, that might not necessarily follow any sort of ASTM or ISO standards. Um, so the first one I'm gonna cover is a research institute who are exploring how the different mechanisms of ankle sprain behavior works. Um, we all know that you don't sprain your ankle when you're standing still. Um, but the exact biomechanics of how an ankle sprain happens um, aren't particularly well understood. Uh, and one of the main reasons for this is that the ankle's very complex. Um, and as you can see from the uh, pictures on the right, I'm not going to butcher those uh, long words there. Um, but there's lots of different movements that the, the ankle can undergo uh, through three different planes when you actually go through a sprain. So. Uh, what this customer was doing um, was actually testing on uh, cadaver limbs and they were using an E10,000 uh, linear torsion machine. Um, they were using uh, a linear torsion because the torsion uh, element allows for the proper simulation of the um, rotary plane for abduction or adduction. Um, and then the linear aspect allows you to simultaneously supply the heel strike motion um, to simulate the full sprain behavior. Um, the complexity, as I mentioned, of this sprain uh, means that you need um, custom fixturing on the base um, and with the um, integrated linear torsion actuator in the crosshead of the machine, uh, this allows the T-slot table on the E10,000 to be freed up for this custom fixture to be used. Um, and this then allows for the other two planes of motion in the frontal and sagittal plane to be completed when they do that heel strike motion uh, to get the full six axis, um, uh, six axis um, sprain. Um, so you can then model that accurately. Uh, the other thing that this customer was doing was uh, actually applying motion capture devices at different key locations on the limb. Um, and using uh, motion cameras synced up with the wave matrix test method to isolate specific areas um, of the sprain uh, to see the stress and strains that are going on in those areas of interest. Um, so the next example I'm going to come to is along a, a similar line, and this is uh, research into tendons, um, specifically the behavior of different types of equine tendons. So the job of a tendon is either to hold uh, a limb in place or to transfer energy from your muscles to your bones. 
Um, but there are also some tendons that act as energy stores uh, for, you know, when you're doing uh, fast, uh, moving from slow to fast motion. Um, and what they wanted to find out here is basically how these energy storing tendons um, undergo different strain behavior um, and also wanted to look at whether older tendons behave differently to those from younger horses. So for this testing, um, our customer used an E1000 because the forces involved were much lower. Um, and they were doing two different types of testing. Uh, so the first one was uh, cyclic loading. Um, and then after they'd done that, they did a pull to failure to get the maximum um, force and maximum strain that those tendons could undergo once they'd been cyclically loaded. Um, what they found was that the tendons that were used for energy storage were a lot more resistant to this uh, cyclic loading. Um, and I think I can say unsurprisingly, they also found that the tendons from younger horses um, were a lot more resistant to the repetitive loading than those from older horses. So with age, your, your tendons unfortunately um, would degrade. <laughs> um, so moving uh, away from sort of muscles and tendons and tissues uh, onto bones, um, we've got another customer <laughs> that is looking at um, modernizing or changing the way that um, bone lengthening operations go uh, to try and make surgery um, easier for patients. So there's typically three sort of markets that this appeals to, and it's either people that have genetic conditions that cause one limb to be smaller than the other, um, people that have had traumatic injury, like a motorcycle accident that have uh, affected, affected their bones, um, and more recently as well, cosmetic reasons, so people that want to be taller. Um, now, historically, um, which you can sort of see in the pictures, this was a, a pretty painful process, multiple stages of lots of invasive surgery. They'd open your leg, break the bone, put this large metal brace around it, and then over the you know, space of a, a few different uh, surgeries of this type, they would lengthen your bone um, and lengthen your leg. So this was just, you know, caused a lot of discomfort for the people going through it. Um, Invasive surgery always leads you prone to, to infection and complications and really isn't what, um, what people want to do going forward. So people are researching, investigating new techniques um, and this customer specifically is looking at sort of smart materials to try and make this a, a simpler process for people. Um, and what they've resulted in is, is rather than going through lots of different um, external um, uh, braces, they get one surgery, uh, one invasive surgery at the beginning, put an implantable device inside your bone that's made of a shape memory alloy. Um, and then over time, you basically have an external device um, that you just pass over your leg, uh, you know, every day, and that metal then moves back to its original length, which is slightly longer. And over the space of um, months and years, that then will slowly extend millimeters or fractions of a millimeter every day. Um, causing your bone to naturally lengthen and the muscle and tissue around it to naturally lengthen as well. So much less invasive and um, much less discomfort for people going through, so that's quite exciting. Um, these people were using an Electropulse E3000 linear torsion, so uh, the smaller machine than the one used for the uh, sprain testing, um, but they used the, the linear torsion for similar reasons in that the um, implant can be better simulated the sort of real conditions that it's going through by having that torsion and that twisting motion. Um, and the other thing that was quite appealing about this particular machine was that this research um, company was new to materials testing. So they'd only done product development and R&D beforehand. Um, so they didn't have a lot of infrastructure in place for the traditional um, requirements of fatigue machines. So for them, the fact that the Electropulse only needs a mains power supply, doesn't have any oil, it's very clean, it's very quiet, um, meant that they could sort of move it anywhere in their lab. And as they uh, rearrange their lab design and, and move things around, they're able to just unplug the machine and move on. Um, so that was, that was very appealing for them. So sticking with legs, um, as well as implantables, we also have people testing limb replacements. 
Um, and these have come a long way over the years in both design and materials used, um, moving from sort of single pieces up to modular, multi-part, full prosthetics that are tailored to specific individuals. Um, but these material advancements, making them lighter and stronger, um, adding in sort of joints and making them more like a, um, a, you know, a human leg, um, have made them more complicated. And as a result of that, the testing involved makes them more complicated. Um, and also international standards are a bit more stringent now than they were 50 or 100 years ago, which I think we can all agree is probably a good thing for this type of industry. Um, so the tests are, are more challenging. Um, so while we can test the individual components, so a lot of them are made from composites, and we can test those on the material level, um, but also at each different stage, people use our machine to test the, um, the components involved until you get to the full prosthesis device. Um, so this particular example uh, was a customer testing the full prosthetic with a, um, with a joint in it. Um, they were actually testing it on a server hydraulic uh, system um, and they were doing um, tens or hundreds of thousands of cycles um, to understand the wear behavior of that joint um, in order to qualify it to go to market to make sure that it is going to last for the number of years that you would want to <laughs> want an expensive process to go through to, to, to really understand how that works. Um, but they actually have a range of machines, so they do the whole from raw material all the way up to the full prosthetic in the same lab. Um, the last um, thing I'm gonna, gonna talk about is going back to the biomaterials. Um, and this is actually a customer doing um, analysis and research into the effect of different types of reconstructed grafts for ACL um, replacement surgeries. So tearing your ACLs fairly common for um, people that play sports, particularly ones where you're doing quick changes of direction, putting a lot of strain on your knee. Um, and the main problem with an ACL tear is whether you tear it a little bit or tear through the whole thing, um, there's not enough blood supply in that area of your knee. So the ACL is actually incapable of repairing itself. Um, so the only way to fix that is to go through surgery and have a graft, um, Put in place to to fix it up um, now typically that's taken from other areas of the leg but most commonly it's from your hamstring um, but obviously your hamstring muscle is very different to your tendon in your in your knee um, and so to make it more suitable you have to precondition um, that, that graft um, to make it a more effective fix um, the issue is that it's a fairly well newish surgery and we're still sort of discovering things and learning more about how, how these graphs work. And so the best method, the optimal preconditioning method is still being worked out. And that's what this customer was looking at. So they were using uh, an E10,000 linear um, and they were doing, using it to simulate three different types of preconditioning methods that are used currently um, to try and understand which of these would be the most effective um, in, in used for ACL recovery surgery. So. They were using a various of different loads um, and different time spans from just a few seconds up to sort of 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then once they'd done that preconditioning testing, they were then simulating the early stages of what someone might go through in rehab um, after the surgery to get back walking. Um, and I mean, the results of that were basically the, the higher loads you use and the longer you precondition pre them for, uh, you had better results from that hamstring graft. So those are just a few examples of things that don't necessarily follow international standards, um, but that are customers using testing for within the sort of biomedical, biomaterials industry. Um, hopefully some of them were, were interesting. Um, I'm now gonna pass over to Mark, who's another one of our applications engineers. We'll round up the presentation before we move through to the Q&A section. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, I'm going to go ahead to advance to the next screen here. All right, so what we've been <clears throat> talking about are, are the various applications. So, uh, but those applications are done on a bigger system. So we've been kind of focused in on the test itself, 
and uh, the types of tests that are done. And I want to zoom out just a little bit and talk about the systems themselves, so a little bit bigger picture of uh, biomedical testing. Uh, test systems for fatigue and biomedical types of tests uh, involving fatigue fall into really two categories. Uh, there are servohydraulic systems. You see those on the left-hand side of the screen. And then electropulse systems. This is an electrodynamic system used for high, higher speeds and fatigue work. Um, the hydraulic systems are the traditional systems used. And we see here a full system layout. And um, again, we've been kind of looking at the test space portion of it. We've been zoomed into this little area. And what I want to do is zoom out and look at the bigger system. So there are several uh, primary components here of the system. The first is the test frame itself. So we have here uh, a system which sits on top of the table. You can see T-slots uh, up at the top. You can see an actuator, and in this case, we're using grips. Those grips can be removed. We can substitute other fixtures. Um, in fact, the grip on the bottom can be removed altogether, and uh, you've seen several examples already today of the use of that T-slot table to fix things too, and that's really important for biomedical testing. Um, to support the frame, uh, we have a controller and a computer. Now, what the controller does is it, it's monitoring what's going on in the test space. So I think, Kelvin, you're the one who mentioned, you know, we're trying to achieve a certain load. Uh, maybe we have to run a 1,000 cycles of something, a repetition. And we want that, for example, to be a sine wave. And the controller is what's making sure that it's hitting that sine wave. The PC part of it, you see sitting on the table here, that's the person interacting with it. That's the, the, if you will, the programming of the test to say, oh, I want it to ramp and then I want it to cycle or whatever the sequence of events needs to be. Our interface to the system is the software that helps us to control the overall um, test. And then the last major component in a typical servo hydraulic system is the pump itself. And you see that sitting off to the right here. And this is because it is a high, historically, this is how fatigue tests were done, uh, servo hydraulic, and that's the pump uh, to provide the motive force for that. Um, now, uh, servo hydraulic technology is a historic technology. It's been around for decades, and it's been the tried and true uh, practice, but there are some uh, challenges to it. And um, those challenges are really centered around the pump. So the pump itself requires three-phase power, industrial power. And um, the pump uh, compresses oil, which goes out to the actuator, and then returns, and it has to be cooled. So it requires cooling water. Also, you can see uh, the pump requires floor space. And in many cases, you know, that's in short supply in laboratories or hospitals or universities or wherever the system's set up. And another challenge with pumps is that they do require periodic oil service. So just like your car needs a filter and an oil change periodically, uh, the pump also needs periodic filter and oil changes as well. So there's a bit of responsibility associated with the pump that, um, you know, ideally wouldn't be there, right? It's not adding value. Um, you know, to the testing itself. We want to get the test done. That's where the focus is, not on the equipment, uh, you know, that's needed for that. Um, other considerations are that the pump itself does make noise, and uh, Intron has fully clad uh, acoustic attenuating technology to try to make it as quiet as possible, but it still makes some noise, and it's better not to have noise if we can help it. And uh, Jonathan, I think you mentioned oil is often not preferred in laboratories, um, you know, either for insurance reasons or, you know, application reasons or just it's not that kind of space. It's a clean space. We want everything to be very clean. Um, oil is often uh, in conflict with that. Um, one thing that the traditional technology does have to its advantage is because it's an old, very established technology, it sometimes is the least expensive for the frame, and that is the just the, the cost of what is up on the screen right now. Um, but what that often doesn't take into account is 
utilities such as getting three-phase power, getting cooling water, um, getting a chiller or other support types of equipment. So even though the frame itself might be the least expensive, it may not be the overall best choice. So Instron worked um, on trying to develop technologies to take care of this, uh, these kinds of challenges, get rid of them ideally. And uh, what we have to do that is our electropulse systems. And that's the systems many of those tests we saw before are actually run on because they're very popular for biomedical applications because of their cleanness, their quietness, and so forth. And this is the um, current technology here. So what we see, the frame itself, in this case, this frame sits on the floor. Um, we also have frames that sit on the table. You've seen those in uh, some applications a little while ago. Um, and then there's also the, um, the controller and the PC. And what you don't see is that whole pump. All of that is gone with this technology. So there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, the electropulse technology we've uh, been producing for about 15 years, um, and it avoids those issues with the pump. So there's no three-phase power, no cooling water required. You can see the floor space required is, is greatly reduced, far less maintenance, and there's no oil in the lab. Um, some additional considerations for this type of system are that um, while the system costs a bit more, probably the utilities, both the initial and the ongoing, the monthly bill, is less as well. And sometimes those are different budgets. Uh, one's capital, one is uh, um, uh, you know, just a monthly budget kind of thing. Um, but their both costs can be less. But there are some other considerations. So this is limited, this technology is limited to 10 kilonewtons. And uh, for some applications, uh, you know, more is needed. Although for most biomedical and orthopedic testing, 10 kilonewtons is, is uh, more than adequate. Uh, so that's usually not a limiting factor for biomedical, but sometimes it is. But that's the technology itself at this point. Um, another uh, consideration, though, is that uh, electropulse systems are capable of multiple turns. So we can do uh, plus and minus 16 turns. That's 32 full revolutions. So you might consider, for example, bone screws uh, as part of that uh, uh, yeah, orthopedic implants and other things. Um, sometimes bone screw applications are done on electropulse systems as well because it can do that multi-turn that we might need. Um, all right, so another aspect of this that has been touched on and I wanted to just uh, you know, give a little more detail on is the actuator in crosshead type design. So, Instron electropulse systems and indeed our axial torsion um, hydraulic solutions will have the actuator in the crosshead. So, that if you look down at the bottom here, in this case we have a bath and it's got just a little bit of red dye in it so that we can see the fluid in there, but the, um, the table itself is open and available for fixturing. So in this case, we have a dynamic bath placed on that T-slot table, but we could have other fixturing, such as we saw with the uh, ankle sprain application earlier. So these T-slots and there's tap holes available for use uh, uh, with anything uh, that we want to put on the base. And what that means is that the load cell, which is the device measuring force, is up at the top, and the actuation is up at the top as well. So for example, if it's an axial torsion application, our linear forces push and pull, and our rotation, our torque, is also from above. And that's a, a, a critical component when you have a bath or are needing the T-slot table for other fixturing. Uh, it allows us to put all of that up top. Now, um, the load cell that we see here can go on the base, certainly, and for multiple turns, you expect it does definitely need to be on the base because the load cell has cables which come off of it for uh, transmitting the, the forces, uh, the information back to the controller, and we wouldn't want those cables uh, winding up with multiple turns. So the load cell can definitely go on the base for those applications. Um, 
but another another benefit to having these two combined is that it is collinear and co-measured. So axial torsion from above makes them, co you know that they are collinear and co-acting. And another uh, aspect of that is that they are co-measured here as well. So we're not measuring, for example, linear force at one end of a load string and torsion at the other. And I know from a um, you know mechanical engineering standpoint, uh, um, we we're always taught that, well, they should be equal and opposite. But I've learned in the biomedical field, that's not always true because of the way tissues and bones and other things respond. Uh, anytime there are measurements in different places, we can get different forces because of you know, off-axis loading or the irregular shape of many of our biomedical uh, devices and fixtures and so forth. Um, that it's important to be careful to apply in a collinear co way. Um, so there's some, some aspects to testing where the actuator from above really becomes a, a critical component. And another thing, um, you know, just touching back on some of the slides that Calvin had, for example, on dental applications is um, the uh, side force action that can sometimes happen. So imagine if we're using this C slot table and we're fixturing something up, we don't always know that our forces are going to be collinear with the axis of application. So we might get a side force, for example, and I think the pictures of the dental fixtures help to show that. We may push down straight, but our fixture is at an angle, and so therefore there's a bit of side force which can result in that. And electrical systems up in the actuator itself have bearings which allow us to have side force uh, induced on them a bit, and uh, they're still uh, suitable for that. So they're, they're rugged for that. So this is kind of zooming out what the big picture is. Um, again, servo hydraulic is that traditional technology dating back decades. And um, you know it's fine, it's tried and true, it's great for a lot of things. Um, and especially high force things. But what we find for biomedical testing is the advantages of an all electric type system are really um, very critical in the lab and that's well suited, the technology is well suited for those types of biomedical applications. So that's what I want to zoom out, give a little better picture of the overall uh, system. And I think now we are gonna open up for questions. So, Harriet, did we have some questions come in? Yeah, so we've had one question so far. Um, you said machines can be used to simulate real conditions. How do you do this in the software? So who's going to answer that one? Sure, so um, actually, I don't know if uh, we can bring up uh, um, some of our application software up on the screen while I'm talking here, but. Um, uh, so we have, um, there's, there's two parts, I I'm, I'm have to interpret what the question means, but there's two parts to that. So we can simulate real world conditions, uh, both in terms of the type of loading that we do, and uh, it's how long that loading goes and the, the, the shape of the loading. So let me explain all three of those. So the type of loading might be, is it a single time application or is it multiple? So we did, for example, prosthetics. Uh, prosthetic legs, for example, you know, those will be loaded, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times or more in their product life. So uh, other things are a single application. So for example, a bone screw, right? That bone screw is going to be installed once. And so the way we can set up the software is a method which tests that single installation to look at what's our max torque. Um, you know, what are the aspects of you know, what torque do we need to insert in different densities of bone, um, those kinds of things. So is it a single-use type thing? Is it a, a, a surgical tool, for example, to get used once? Does it get used multiple times? Is it something which is used tens of thousands of cycles? And we can set the test method up to simulate each one of those things. And if it's just cycles to failure, um, maybe we just do a sine wave and do, you know, a hundred thousand cycles or a million cycles. Um, or we can actually uh, simulate the actual measure. So this, I'm going to try to get to the other end of this question, which is, you know, what if, what if there is an impact or what if 
uh, it's not a regular sine wave in that we're simulating a, a, a strange shape. So, you know, um, for example, a fall, right? If somebody falls, that's not a sine wave. It's, it's more of an impact. Can we strain gauge something, measure the actual strain on it, and simulate that irregular shape? A good example might be uh, uh, blood pressure for a heartbeat, right? That's not a, a sine wave, that's an irregular shape. Can we simulate those? Absolutely. The controller can be given a signal that says the shape looks like this, and we can ask the test system to follow that irregular shape as well uh, within the limits of the hardware, right? It's uh, uh, physics. We're limited by physics still, unfortunately, but um, as long as we've got the physics to back us, uh, yes, we can simulate real world real world conditions in a number of ways. So I'm hoping I've answered the question comprehensively uh, for folks. Harriet, any other questions? Yes. Um, another one, it was mentioned that the machine could be moved around a lab. Are there any limitations on where it can be placed? Yep. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump in on this one still. Um, so uh, in, the, in the historic uh, context, when we had that pump, we had to have three-phase power and cooling water. And those are, are hard things to just pick up and move. With Electropulse, we have just a single phase power, and it's really simple. It's like putting an electrical outlet in any place in our homes, our kitchens, our workplace. Um, you know, it does need power, but it can be moved around the lab. And so as long as there's two things, uh, there's the electric power for it, which is very easy for single phase power, and then ceiling height is the only other thing. Sometimes uh, people have a really low ceiling. Um, as long as you have the you know the floor space and the ceiling's tall enough, that's it. And ceiling height is not especially a problem in most cases. But um, you know if there's a, a air conditioning duct right above, well then you know maybe we have to pick a slightly different spot. But yes, it can be moved pretty much anywhere in the lab. Kelvin, would you did you want to add to that or? Um, no, I think you pretty much covered it there. Markets, uh, yeah, it depends on the. I guess the only other thing would be it depending on um, the sort of tests you're running. If you're running very either very high frequency or very large amplitude tests, you just want to make sure that the surface you're putting it on is stable and uh, possibly supported to the ground. Um, so yeah, we we have see support tables that we can supply with the sort of electrical units, but otherwise. Um, Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's really wherever you've got access to a plug um, and, and space around the machine to get to it, that there really is, yeah, not, not a huge amount of other infrastructure that, that you need to take into consideration. Yes, right. Yeah, so no, you mentioned this. Um, um, no. I'll just add on to what Jonathan said. Um, uh, for biomedical applications, many times we're testing at the, you know, five hertz and less. And so um, those aren't as aggressive. But this test system, electrical systems, can be used for just basic materials work, which can be 30, 40 hertz or more testing. And um, you know, so you, so we do have a very sturdy table for our tabletop type systems that we can use as well, if if that's just needed, if it's basic materials testing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. So regarding soft tissue testing, ACL for example, are there any special clamps you suggest using? So on this, I can't speak for the exact ACL uh, uh, example that I, that I mentioned because I didn't, didn't work on that one. Um, but I was familiar with what was used for the tendon testing for the, for the horses. Um, and <clears throat> Essentially, what we've done there, and we've done multiple times in the past, is work very closely with the uh, customer that wants to do the testing. They, they actually came to our um, to our factory in the UK, um, brought some specimens with them, um, and we work with them to design suitable clamping um, for that testing. That, that test actually had a, a miniature bath uh, with two clamps integrated into it, so they could do the testing um, in vivo. 
um, but there may not be sort of our standard grips and clamps all sort of available to be seen on our, our website and we can share but if none of those are suitable um, and for soft tissue they probably won't be because they're more all purpose um, we have done lots of custom fixturing in the past um, and have done uh, or have a number of customers that do soft tissue testing so if you um, write into us or, or give us a call and let us know what the specifics of your specimens are um, we can collaborate with you to make sure that we get a, a gripping solution that works. Okay. Okay, right. Um, I think that's all we've got time for, gentlemen. So thank you ever so much for your presentations. Now, if we weren't able to answer your question, then we will be in touch with you after this session. So just a few quick notes before we wrap things up. Here's a quick look at what's coming up for the rest of today. If you'd like to attend but aren't registered yet, just head to instrum.com and sign up now. The recording from this session will be available on our YouTube channel in just a short while. Each of you will also receive an email with a link to the recording. Just another reminder about receiving the single use code for free access to the Essentials of Biomedical Testing e-learning course. In a moment, when the session ends, a survey will pop up and there will be a question related to this. You'll just need to complete the survey and indicate whether you would like access to this course. With that said, I just want to thank you, Kelvin, Jonathan and Mark for a great presentation. And thanks to all of you for attending. We really appreciate your time.